Hello sophomores, this is Father Monko, and I'm, uh, in this video we're going to take a brief look at the question of the priestly ordination of women in the Roman Catholic Church. Now, this is not going to look at all the arguments against the Church's position, and it's not even really going to explore why the Church teaching is what it is. In this video, we're just going to get an understanding of what is the foundation of the Church's teaching. What is it that she believes? The theological speculation and dealing with the objections, that'll come later. So the... Uh, you know, for most of the church's history, she's or you know she has ordained only men. That's been her constant practice. And so the question of women's ordination hasn't really come up until the 20th century. And Pope Paul VI was the first one who had to deal with that. Once the Anglican Church decided that it was going to ordain women, as they were considering doing that, Paul VI sent them a letter, asking them not to do it; that it would cause further divisions in uh, Christendom and amongst uh, various Christian bodies. And the Anglicans went ahead with it, with it anyway. And so Paul VI's response was to issue a document called Inter Insignores. And this was to set out the church's teaching on the matter. And Inter Insignores said a couple of things. Basically that the ordination of women to the priesthood was not acceptable. First of all, because Jesus left us the example of choosing only men. And he is the foundation of the church. He is God made man. And so his example is important for us. Secondly, the church has not in 2,000 years done this. That we've gone through lots of changes and back and forth and different currents in history and social pressures and we've never done this before. And the third point, which is kind of tied to the second but is kind of different from it, is that we haven't done this in 2,000 years for very intentional reasons because the church has consistently held as part of her official teaching authority, that's what the magisterium is, from the Latin word magister, meaning teacher, that the church's official teaching is that this is part of God's plan. It's not just a result of unhappy human accident or human prejudice or any of that sort of thing, that this is part of God's plan for the church. So let's look at some of these uh, three points that Paul VI brings up. And first we're going to explore the biblical record on the issue. So here is a passage from the Gospel of Luke chapter 6 where he talks about Jesus choosing his twelve. In those days he departed to the mount to pray and he spent the night in prayer to God. When day came he called his disciples to himself and from them he chose twelve whom he also named apostles. Simon whom he named Peter and his brother Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James the son of Alphaeus, Simon who was called a zealot, and Judas the son of James and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. So here we have in Luke chapter 6, Jesus choosing his apostles in a very deliberate manner. This isn't kind of on a whim. It's you know not out of fear. It's after spending an, a whole night in communion with his father. And after this, he comes down and he makes this decision of who are the twelve. Now, these weren't the only people who followed with him or were with him in the crowd. But there's this select group that's formed as a result of this particular decision that's made. And Jesus spending the night in prayer is, is very important because Luke is indicating something here to us. Whenever Luke wants to emphasize uh, a certain point in Jesus' life, he has him spending time alone with the Father in prayer. Here's a list of key moments in Jesus' life when Luke has Jesus praying to the Father. Baptism, the choosing of the twelve, receiving Peter's confession of faith, the transfiguration, teaching the disciples to pray, the Last Supper, uh, being on the Mount of Olives in agony, and on the cross. So that's quite a list. And the fact that choosing the twelve apostles is one of those uh, results of Jesus' prayer to the Father she tells us that this isn't the wind, that this is coming from the heart of God himself. Why? Well, that's an interesting question and something that we're going to explore later. But what we start, what we start with is simply the fact of what God has done. What has the God-man done? That's, that has to be, uh, I think, a key question for us as Christians. Okay. So let's look at how the church has, uh, and how John Paul II definitively summed up this teaching. Although the teaching that priestly ordination is to be reserved to men alone has been preserved by the constant and universal tradition of the church and firmly taught by the magisterium, the teaching authority, in its more recent documents, at the present time in some places it is nonetheless considered still open to debate, or the church, church's judgment that women are not to be admitted to ordination 
is considered to have a merely disciplinary force. Before we get to John Paul II's conclusion or response to this, let's just pull apart some of the key terms here. So uh, he's saying that the church's teaching that ordination is reserved to men alone has been preserved by the constant and universal tradition of the church, capital T tradition. And what he's saying here is that tradition from trado tradere in Latin, something that is handed on, that this is part of the official church teaching handed on. That this is not, you know, like how many, something like how many candles do we have on the altar during Mass? Well, that's a small T tradition. The big T tradition is the faith of the church itself, this deposit that's been given by Jesus to the apostles and passed on, and not just in sacred scripture, but in the whole life of the church and how she operates, including who does she, the church, ask to come forward and be ordained. So uh, he's saying that this is something that belongs to the patrimony, to the heritage of the church. He said, despite the fact that the church has always done it this way for very intentional reasons, in some places there's still some question about this. It's still open to debate. And even some want to say, oh, well, yeah, that's the church's practice, but it's, it has merely disciplinary force. A discipline is something that can be changed. So if the church says that, you know, we're not going to eat meat on Fridays, and on, that's a discipline. The church invented it, and if the church invents it, it can do away with it. But if the church didn't invent the practice of only ordaining men, if that's something she received from Jesus, then it is not a discipline. It is not something that she can do away with. So here is John Paul II's response to this situation where there's still this question in the air. Wherefore, in order that all doubt may be removed regarding a matter of great importance, a matter which pertains to the church's divine constitution itself, in virtue of the ministry of confirming the brethren, I declare that the church has no authority whatsoever to confer priestly ordination on women and that this judgment is to be definitively held by all the church's faithful. Okay, let's parse this one a little bit. He's saying by this declaration he's using his authority as Pope, as a successor of Peter, as you know, the chief of the apostles, and as head of the church on earth, that he wants to remove any doubt about this question. He wants to close the debate and end the discussion. And he wants to do this because this is something that goes to the, the church's constitution because who can be ordained determ determines who, who governs the church. So the whole structure of the church is affected by this question. And so it's Peter and his successors in Luke chapter 22 that are given the mission by Jesus of confirming the faith of the brethren and strengthening them. John Paul II says, I declare that the church has no authority whatsoever to confer priestly ordination on women and that this judgment is to be definitively held by all the faithful. Now notice, he, he's very careful here. He doesn't say women can't be ordained. He doesn't say that God couldn't choose to ordain women if he wanted to. What he is saying is that Jesus never gave the church the power and the church has to live within those limits. So she cannot ordain women. It's not that, doesn't say that women are bad or evil or inferior to men, but he says the church just haven't, hasn't been given the power to ordain them, and so she can't, because that's not, a sacrament is not something a church can invent. It has to come from God and God alone. And finally he says this judgment is to be definitively held by all the faithful, that the, you know, that the door is closed on this question. Now we can always ask the question why, we can always try and explore more deeply why, you know, what is this, why is this the case, why would God choose to do this? Th those are still very good questions, but this is something at the end of the day that the church is, he is using the church's full authority to assert the question is closed in terms of can, is this something that the church can change in the future? And he says, no. We are limited by the reasons mentioned above by, by Paul VI, by the example of Jesus, by the church's practice, and by the church's constant teaching. So that basically outlines what the church's position is.